Hey everyone, so welcome back. I want to address a very practical issue today, which is that once we have done transformations on our time series to induce stationarity, and we would do this because we require stationarity for a lot of the time series models we want to use. After we do that, and let's say we forecast the time series, how do we get those predicted numbers back into the original time series rather than the stationary version of the time series? So the subject matter on this video will be tracking the number of views that a YouTube video gets. So what you're seeing here is my actual YouTube studio. And this is the number of views over time for a recent video that I published. So the shape of the views usually follows this kind of log curve where the growth in the beginning is really fast because people are getting notified and it's a new piece of content. But as time goes on, the growth of the video usually slows down. So it looks like this log curve kind of thing. So let's say we're trying to forecast the number of views that this video will receive in the next three hours. So we see that we have 72 hours of data so far and we would like to know how many views will this video receive in the next three hours. Now we would love to use our time series models, but of course this thing is 100% not stationary. The mean is increasing over time. So we need to do some clever transformations to make this time series stationary, then go ahead and fit a model and forecast. And then we'll need to take those predictions and undo the transformations to get the number of views. So it sounds maybe complex, but I'll walk you through each step here. So here's our original time series, and here's our game plan. The first thing we'll do is normalize the time series. The reason we do this is because of the exponentiation in the next step. Whenever we raise an exponent to the power of a number, we don't want it to overflow. So we go ahead and take these numbers, which are up to 40,000, which would definitely overflow, and get them into a more easy to manage space. So we'll do V sub t, which is our original time series, minus its mean and divided by its standard deviation. So nothing special, just like a z-score normalization here, and that we'll call n sub t. Now we're going to exponentiate n sub t, and the reason we do that is because, as we said before, this looks like a log curve. So we're hoping that if we exponentiate it, it'll straighten it out, so it'll look more like a linear growth instead, which is easier for us to manage. So for that reason, we do e to the power of n sub t, and that gets called e sub t. So this is the exponentiation step. And finally, since we're expecting that to look like linear growth, we know that in that case, we should take a first difference in order to induce stationarity. So we do e sub t goes to d sub t by taking a first difference, which is simply d sub t is equal to e sub t minus e sub t minus 1. And if we put all these things together, this is the formula, the mathematical formula that takes us from the original series v sub t to the transformed series d sub t, which we hope is stationary. So let's go ahead and actually do these transformations. Normalization, first things first, get mu and sigma, subtract mu from the series and divide by sigma, and we get this series. Now something quick to note is that we haven't changed the shape of the series at all, so it's just as non-stationary as before. But now notice that the numbers are between negative 3 and 1, which is much nicer for the exponentiation step. Which is what comes next, so we do e to the power of that normalized series, and as we predicted, we got this kind of linear straight growth, which is a lot easier for us to manage. So again, this is not stationary, and I'm doing the Dickey Fuller test. The video for that I'll link in the description below, but basically this test just checks whether a time series is stationary. And if this p-value were less than 0.05, we would say it's stationary, but clearly this p-value is almost as close to 1 as it could be, so this is not stationary. So we'll go ahead and do a first difference, which we can easily do in pandas with the dot diff function, so this just takes the difference between the time series and the lagged 1 version of the time series, and we get this series here. So visually this looks great, looks stationary, let's go ahead and check it against our Dickey Fuller test, and we get a p-value of 0 0.00003. 8, so clearly less than 0.05, and we have succeeded in taking our original time series up here and making it stationary down here. So that was the first part of this video. Now we're going to go ahead and fit a model to it. So this is a little bit of practice in how do we decide which orders to fit. So I go ahead and compute the PACF for the transform time series, and this is going to tell us the AR order we might want to use. So we see that 1, 2, three, four lags seem to be significant. Of course, you can make cases for higher lags, but I'm going to start with an AR4 process. Now we go ahead and check the ACF to inform us about the order of the moving average. And here it's a little bit more clear that maybe one lag is sufficient. So I'm going to start with a ARMA41 model. So I go ahead and create that model, and I fit that model, and then I predict three hours forward. So I want to predict what happens in the next three hours for this video's growth. I get the predictions here, 
and I go ahead and plot them. So again, what you're looking at is the first difference exponentiated normalized views, lots of transformations that have been applied. And then we go ahead and predict the next three hours of the time series, and then these bands are the upper and lower confidence limits. So in previous videos, I've usually stopped here and I've said, okay, we made these predictions, great. But of course, I left out a key fact, which is that we want to know what are the predictions in terms of views, not first difference exponentiated normalized views. This is not really helpful for us. So how do we go ahead and take these predictions and transform it back, undo all of the transformations? So the honest answer is that you need to look at the mathematical form of the transformations that you did and then carefully write code to undo those transformations. So for example, what I mean by that is, let me scroll up here. We see that the mathematical function that takes us from our original series v sub t to our transform series d sub t is this function here. Now, it looks sort of complicated. Yours might be less complicated or more complicated depending on how many differences you take or what kind of operations you're doing. So if I undo all the transformations in that function, and it's just a matter of a little bit of simple algebra, what I get is that v sub t plus one hat. So this is the predicted number of views in the next hour. And this, to be clear, is views. This is not any function of views. This is just pure views themselves is equal to sigma times natural log, the predicted transformed number of views. So just to be clear again, d sub t plus one hat is the predicted transformed number of views. So it is literally the value right here, the leftmost prediction in this transformed space. So it's that plus e to the power of v sub t minus mu over sigma plus mu. So I agree, this looks a little bit complicated, but the fact is that my transformations are not gonna be the same as yours because the signature of your original time series may not exactly match the signature of my original time series. So I think you really do need to sit down with a pencil and a piece of paper and figure out how to undo the transformations that you did. And once you're confident with that, you can go ahead and write the code. So just to match up the code to the formula I've written up here, we can see that the prediction is given by sigma times, just like I have sigma times up here, log, just like I have log up here, prediction zero, which is the same thing as d sub t plus one hat, plus exponentiated series minus mu over sigma, which is exponentiated series minus mu over sigma, and all of that plus mu, all of that plus mu. So we see that this mathematical form matches up to the code I've written down here. Now one last caveat I'll say is that this is all well and good for the first hour that's predicted, but think about the second hour that's predicted. Now, if we were to put t plus twos everywhere you see a t plus one, you would notice that we would need information about v sub t plus one. And since we don't have that, we're going to use the estimated v sub t plus one that we just got, which is called first pred here. So that's what this for loop is for, which is basically building up this list of predicted values and then using the most recent entry in that list to make an informed decision about the prediction of the next value. So go ahead and analyze this code and make sure that the procedure that I've just described in words and mathematical symbols makes sense to you. So once I do that, we get this graph. So we see that this is the original number of views and the predicted number of views is right here. So this looks like it matches up, but let's zoom in because that's really hard to see. And we see that this is the original series up to the 72nd hour. And we see that the prediction of number of views for hours 73, 74, and 75 looks like this. And these are the upper and lower limits. So it looks like it checks out. This looks reasonable to me. So again, in a nutshell, this video was about how do I take a arbitrary time series, go ahead and do some transformations to induce stationarity in that time series, and then build a model for that transform time series, and then do some predictions for that transform time series and then take those predictions and undo the transformations and get predictions for my original time series. So this is typically what you're going to have to do in any real time series problem because the series you're going to be given is likely not stationary. So you have to keep track of the transformations you did and think about how to undo those transformations as well. Okay, so this code will be available online, of course, as well as the data that I used. And if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Please like and subscribe for more videos just like this, and I'll see you next time.